creating support. Support Jirpare Jirpe. Thank you. Kadam sir. Kadam sir, pardon me. ओके मंडळी गुड आफ्टरनून आपण बीसी सुरू करूया कदम सर आपण सुरू करायचं सर जॉईन हॅलो हा सर सुरू करायचं का हा हो तर तेवढ्यासाठी मी म्हटलं तर म्हणून म्हटलं आपले सगळे मंडळी जॉईन झाली आहेत तर आता मंडळी आजचा आपला महत्वाचा तिसरा आपण हे सेशन घेतो आहोत आणि याच्यामध्ये आपल्याकडे आज डॉक्टर कपिल झिरपे आहे आले आहेत इंटेन्सिव्हिस्ट आहेत आणि मला असं वाटतंय कदम सरही त्यांच्या बरोबर आहेत आणि सध्या आपल्याला जे काही तुमच्या रेस्पिरेटरी सपोर्टच्या दृष्टीने कोविडच्या मॅनेजमेंट मध्ये प्रॉब्लेम येतोय तर त्या दृष्टीने आपल्याला व्यवस्थित पद्धतीनं या सेशन मध्ये आपण चर्चा करू तर त्याच्यामुळे आपण हे सुरू करू त्यांचं सेशन झाल्यानंतर तुम्हाला सगळ्यांना ज्या काही सूचना असतील शंका असतील तर त्या पण विचारा तर त्याच्यामुळे डॉक्टर झिरपेंचं या सेशनला स्वागत आपण करूया ते आले त्याच्याबद्दल त्यांचे आभार पण मानूया त्यांचे आणि कदम सरांचे तर सर आपण आपले सेशन सुरू करूया हो येस बेसिकली डॉक्टर कपिल झिरपे इज एम डी चेस अँड देन इज वर्किंग इन इंटेन्सिव्ह केअर आणि त्यांनी कोविड नाईन्टीनचे बरेच पेशंट त्यांच्याकडे मॅनेज केलेले आहेत द बेसिक देते आणि ही विल बी टॉकिंग मोस्टली द प्रॅक्टिकल आस्पेक्ट की पेशंटला काय काय झालं की काय करायचं कसं करायचं सो ही इज काइंड इन अफ टू मेक दिस लेक्चर ऍज सिम्पल ऍज पॉसिबल सो ऍज टू लर्न वॉट टू डू वेन वी फेस विथ द प्रॉब्लेम तर वी कॅन डेफिनेटली स्टार्ट कपिल चालू करू शकतो चालू हो सर हो सर पहिल्यांदा थँक्यू सर फॉर काइंड इंट्रोडक्शन अँड इट्स माय प्लेजर टू हॅव अ लेक्चर ऑन द रेस्ट पॉटी थेरपी बिकॉज दिस इज व्हेरी क्लोज टू मी ऍज अ बिंग अ चेस पिजिशन ऍज वेल एज वर्किंग इन आयसी ऑलमोस्ट मोर दॅन ट्वेंटी फाय इयर्स अँड आय ट्राय टू सिम्प्लिफाय द मोस्ट ऑफ द रेस्ट पॉटी सपोर्ट पार्ट इन कोविड जस्ट टू दे लुक एट दिस एक्सरे don't get frightened these are all corona positive patients you can get uh, bronchovascular marking for uh, prominence um, airway uh, air trapping you can get uh, bilateral shadows you can get again the lower lobe shadows you can get middle lobe upper lobe shadow bilateral extensive bilateral extensive right upper lobe pneumonia so all types of the presentations you can get in a corona virus first thing second thing don't go by the imaging alone my sincere request to everyone is don't read x ray alone x ray has to be the read on the background of the clinical setting all these patients survived and went home first thing second thing x ray doesn't decide the severity of the case your clinical presentation what is his tachycardia what is his blood pressure what is his oxygen saturation how much oxygen he require might be this x ray is too bad but his oxygen requirement is 2 to 4 liter might be this x ray looks too good but not very bad on the at least x ray yes but he might be on a uh, very high uh, oxygen support and may need intubation and ventilation so radiology should not be read only background only uh, radiology part you have to see as a clinician first so we all are clinician be with the patient assess the patient bedside and then take a call so with this positive note i will start my uh, slide presentation it will be around the 40 minutes i will try to just clear the concept what we are getting from the bed side like all of us know that this covid starts in december now it is not a old concept we all are quite familiar with this terminology we all are quite knowledgeable about the corona so please don't say that hey, this is a new disease or we don't know about the corona second thing if you see the statistic there are almost 20% of the patients only develop the severe uh, illness who require the icu and out of that 5 to 7% only require the uh, oxygen therapy and out of that few require the ventilator so we will talk about the those 10 to 20% patients who are you are admitting in icu for the management of respiratory failure and the your uh, rate of the cure your rate of the response is decided by the so many aspects like cultural difference admission criteria your age comorbidities what type of the team is available how much they are experienced which are the backup facilities are there and so on and so on so don't compare with the aic with the bic and cic with the dic you have to just see what type of the patients they are getting and how they are managing so 
uh, in short, before starting into the respiratory support in uh, acute respiratory failure in corona, let's say the respiratory failure, the basic definition of respiratory failure when your PO2 is less than 60 or PCO2 more than 50 is a respiratory failure. And there are two types. One type is a type 1 respiratory failure and type 2. This is all physiology, but please, when unless and until you know the physiology, you cannot able to manage this patient. Like in type 1, there is hypoxia plus normocapnia or hypocapnia. While in type 2, there is a hypoxia with hypercapnia. So there are so many reasons like type 1 respiratory failures are generally because of the diffusion failure, it is because of the pneumonia, it is because of the uh, lung disease, while type 2 failure are generally because of the ventilatory failure. Ventilatory failure means might be there is a CO2 is rise along with the hypoxia, like spinal cord injuries uh, in GBS, myasthenia, COPD, drug overdose, so all CNS manifestation might be associated with the CO2 uh, retention and the type 2 respiratory failure. So I'm going to cover the whole spectrum of the respiratory support with this, like the, what is the cell phone, what is the oxygen target, what is the high flow systems, what are the low flow systems, when to take a call, how to go ahead with the intubation, when, wh what is the ARDS, how to manage the ARDS, what are the additional ventilatory precautions or the adjuvant therapy you can try, extubation winning and support with care. Now the first part is the cell proteins. This is the new terminology, but now quite familiar in all intensives and those who are managing the patients of the hypoxia in Corona. Cell proning is nothing but not necessary when patient requires oxygen, you should prone him. Before a uh, patient requires oxygen, you may prone him. And that is a cell proning. Cell proning starts with the, uh, you can, yeah, the time period is 30 minutes to two hours. What do you mean by that? If the patient is conscious, patient is obeying, is slightly feeling breathlessness. His oxygen requirement is not very high. It might be half liter, one liter sometimes. He requires two liters sometimes. You don't require oxygen. In this initial part of the uh, illness, if you ask the patient to get self-prone, like the, ask the patient to get the self-prone for 30 minutes to maximum two hours, then she, she can lie on one side, then supine, on, again, on the other side, and again prone. Believe me, if you explain the patient the importance of the disproning, if you explain the procedure, might be initially 5, 10 minutes or 15 minutes, patient may feel suffocated, patient may feel choking. But after 10 minutes, 15 minutes, if the patient start getting the effect of the proning, he will happily continue for two hours. So the whole, whole success of the, your cell proning is how you are having the good uh, communication with the patient, how you explain to the patient, be with the patient for 10 to 15 minutes, and let the patient feel that opening of the airways. That is what the success of the cell proning. We are regularly doing it. Like look at this patient. You see the supine. When you ask for the lateral position, like a proning. Anybody can comfortably do this. This is easily possible. It doesn't require any machinery, any facilities, any extra knowledge. Minimum 30 minutes, maximum two hours. If suppose I put a patient, I ask the patient to be the spontaneous proning for 15 minutes, 30 minutes. I will ask after 30 minutes, are you comfortable? If she says, yes, I am comfortable, I will continue for another one hour. After one hour, I will ask the patient, are you comfortable? She said, yes, I am more um, feeling much better. Continue. Like that, you can continue maximum up to the two hour. Then ask her to uh, make her supine. Then after two hours, lateral. Like that. It is, it is a, one of the most Effective therapy, I will say, in the patient in the initial stage of the respiratory failure. The next phase is oxygen delivery. Oxygen delivery, you can start from the rebreathing to breathing system, from nasal cannula to the venturi mask, the venturi mask with the mask with the reservoir. But once you understand what is meant by this rebreathing and breathing system, and what is meant by the low flow and high flow, generally all these nasal masks, mask, simple mask, and mask with the reservoir are the low flow systems. While high flow system is a different, we'll come to that. Which are the targets? One should know which are the patients in our day-to-day -day clinical practice are for the low rate. Like my patient is conscious, obeying, respiratory rate is around about 20, 22 to 24. Saturation is borderline 90 to 91. Uh, she is not very, or he or she is not very breathless. I prefer on a low uh, flow. That means the low dependent patient is only required the supportive oxygen therapy. So then we can continue with the nasal O2. Maximum up to the 6 liter. If she is still hypoxic, I can continue on the simple mask. Still hypoxic, I can go ahead with the venturi mask. Still hypoxic, that means now you need to change the system from low dependency to medium dependency. So what I will ask her, I will ask her for the CPAP. If suppose still she is breathless or he is breathless, I will go for the high dependency. That means I am going towards the high flow or non-invasive ventilation. 
So one should one should decide the therapy of the oxygen requirement bedside with, with discussion with the patient, following the pulse oximetry, heart rate, BP, everything. If the tachycardia is worsening, your saturation is below 90%, your respiratory is jumping more than 30, there is a sweating, accessory muscles get utilized. These are the bedside parameters they can very well guide you the which system patient needs. Not necessary, you should go from nasal to the NIV. Might be the on day one, the day the, within one hour, patient need an IV. That is a clinical judgment. You cannot say that I will start the nasal O2, then simple mass, then venturi mass, and then I will for the NIV. No, might be my patient need on admission NIV. Might be my patient needs on admission CPAP. Might be my patient needs the CPAP and then nasal O2 up to four hours. So this is the beauty of this oxygen therapy. The patient decides the delivery system. Patient parameters guides you which uh, delivery system you should use. So if you see the simple classification, the low dependency, either low volume or fl high flow, low flow systems are nasal cannula up to six meters. One of the drawback of the nasal cannula is key, there is no precise oxygen FI2 fraction of uh, inspired oxygen you can provide. Right about 37 to 42.5, round about. It is not the mass approximately. Simple mass, you can go up to the 50 to 60%, but there is no guarantee. There is a precise FI2 you can deliver. Reservoir mass, again, you can go up to the 80 to 90%, uh, but there is no precise way. That's why they are low flow system. And when you go for the high flow system, venturi mask or high, high blender. What is mean by that? That means now you move from the less dependent to the more dependent. You move, move from the less precise effort to the precise effort. So look at this figure. So this is a nasal oxygen, typical nasal O2. Look at the, how we can uh, keep it. It is a comfort of the patient. Maximum up to the six liter, approximately FI2 37 to 40 percent. But when you move from uh, nasal O to the reservoir uh, venturi mass to the simple mass, look at the system. The, the venturi mask is a very particular system where the air dilution and the flow of the oxygen decides the your precise oxygen. So which FI2 you have kept? How much oxygen liter? Whether it is a nine liter, whether it is a 12 liter, whether it is a 15 liter. So the flow of the oxygen. Dilution of the air to the venturi decides the preciseness of oxygen. So when you are saying venturi mask, so you are straightway going for the precise oxygenation. There's a color coding. There's a white, uh, yellow, green color shading. So from the distance also, you can imagine if there is a white, that means it is a nine liter flow. If it is a green, it is a 15 liter. That means patient is more breathless. Patient requires the more monitoring. Patient may require the NIV, patient may require the high flow or require the intubation and ventilation. So this is how we go through the different oxygen therapy and this is how we decide the what patient needs. And about the simple mask, there is, a, there is no guarantee of the preciseness because there is a dilution of the air and there is a no venturi. So a simple question and simple answer. How to monitor the oxygen? Suppose patient comes to in my ICU. Patient is breathless. He using the accessory muscle. I will I will just first check whether he is uh, tachypneic, tachycardia, oxygen saturation. So pulse oximetry is the first. If the oxygen saturation is less than 90, my next uh, this thing will be the blood gas. Please, irrespective of the reasons and facility, try to do the blood gas within two hours of the admission in any given situation in a respiratory failure. Without blood gas, it is very difficult to differentiate the level of PO2, type 1, and type 2 respiratory failure. Pulse oximetry may guide you regarding uh, your uh, deteriorating patient, but that is not the good idea to manage the respiratory failure. So try and do the, your ABG at least within two hours, considering the, your current situation, considering the facilities available, and accordingly you manage. Second thing, manage the patient with the regular ABG, if possible, or pulse oximetry. If you start with the six liters of oxygen after two hours, saturation is 96%, make it five liters. After 24 hours, it is 96%, make it 2 liter. After 24 hours, it is still more than 94%. Patient may uh, don't need the uh, nasal O2. So like that, you can uh, acceleration as well as the uh, deacceleration, you can decide on the basis of the pulse oximetry the ABG. Please note down, your PO2 targets are more than 55. We don't need 90 or 100 or 110 PO2s, those who are on a low dependency system. So your target should be PO2 more than 55 and saturation more than 90, might be 90 to 94 will be comfortable in corona patient. 
Then most importantly, in patients with the type 2 respiratory failure, that means patient is a COPD, you need to do the more frequent blood gases to decide the ventilatory management as well as decide the, your pharmacological treatment. Suppose your first ABG, there is a CO2 retention. After four hours, there is a CO2 retention. After six hours, there is a still CO2 retention. That means either your ventilatory management is not inadequate or patient may need the more pharmacological supports like more frequency of bronchodilators, steroids, treatment of the underlying cause. So like that, see, these corona patients are no, not a different anyone. They are like a regular patient. Only you need to manage them in isolation ward. You need to offer them each and everything. If they require physiotherapy, please go ahead. If they require the mucolytic, please go ahead. If they require the uh, ventilatory support, please go ahead. If they require the regular blood gases, you need to do those blood gases. And if it is not uh, facilities are available, take the help from the uh, available one. And this is how you monitor the oxygen therapy. Oxygen therapy is a 24 by 7 uh, concept. Oxygen therapy should be regularly managed by the on-duty doctors. And if the patient doesn't need any uh, oxygen therapy, please don't offer them. Might be 96 situation of the room air is uh, okay, irrespective of the exercise. Now next part, okay. My patient was on a nasal uh, O to six liters. His still saturation is 90%. There is a tachypnea, tachycardia. Okay, I will start with the simple mask. Still my saturation is uh, not coming up. I will start with the venturi mask. Still my patient is uh, not. So I will go with the high flow nasal oxygen. What is high consistency? Try and understand the concept of the high flow nasal oxygen. One of the most popular therapy across the Indian world in corona patient is the high flow nasal oxygen. What do you mean by that? In routine oxygen, like in low uh, flow systems, like nasal ozone, we can maximum go up to the 15 liter per minute. Second thing, that air is not adequately humidified. That is a dry air. So there is no guarantee of the peep or there is no guarantee of the functional residual capacity with that. Second thing, because of the dryness and the high flow that can damage your mucociliary uh, protective mechanism and the patient secretions become more dry, and patient might retain the secretion. That is one of the major pitfalls regarding the low flow system. What is high flow nasal oxygen? Here the heated humidifier uh, uh, oxygen flow is there. You can go up to the 60 liters. You can go maximum up to the 16 liters per minute humidified air. So it will prevent from damaging your mucociliary protective mechanism. It can maintain, there is no leak. So it can maintain your uh, flow of the oxygen. And it, it has round about up to the five meter uh, centimeter of the PEEP you can maximum with the high flow nasal oxygen. That will help to reduce your functional residual capacity in a tachypneic patient. And that is how the patient responds better. What are the advantages? First thing, it is very comfortable. Look at this patient. He's sitting down at nine o'clock in the corona unit with the high flow. Uh, see, this is the easy to uh, apply. Patients are quite free. You can mobilize the patient. The beauty of this system is you can mobilize the patient. What are the disadvantages of this system? They are costly because your low flow systems are very cheap. They are costly, not easily available. Third thing, you require the proper training. You need to uh, have the staff trained for the using this system. And though we are saying we can mobilize, but still patient is uh, limited to the bed and surrounding the bed. He cannot move around. That is one of the pitfall of this system. If you see there is a flow meter, we can go up to the 60 liters per minute. There is a humidifier, heated humidifier air, which can go and it will prevent the damage. That is what the high flow system. This is a high flow system. This is a high flow system. Now, one should, one should remember while using the high flow system in corona patient. It is not at all risk free. Please, I, I got a lot of call from the periphery that is, shall we buy the high flow? I say, yes, you should go ahead, but you should know what, what are the major pitfalls. What are the pitfalls of the high flow? It is a highly erosion generation because there is no seal. The flow is going to the nose, but patient might breathe to the mouth. So it is a high flow system which may generate the erosion. And that is risky for the viral load. If the patient is having the pneumonia, is a high viral load. With this high flow, there is a surrounding area, there is a viral load. And there is a risk to the healthcare worker. So what, what precaution one should take? Vigilant monitoring. Just regularly, one hourly, just see what is the flow. Then try to keep the minimum flow. That means 20 to 30. If somebody is required 45 to 60, your environment is not safe. You are under the unsafe environment. And might be that patient may need the NIV or regular intubation ventilation. That is another thing. Second thing, 
nebulization therapy. Try and avoid the nebulizer therapy during the high flow phase because again they are the erosion generation therapy. So inhaled medications or inhaled gases are not a good idea uh, during the corona pandemic. Plus, this is not proven, but this this is what the something practically I like this idea. Okay, additionally, placing the nasal uh, N95 mask or surgical mask over the high flow. I think that that is what the and this is for safety. I always say we are not heroes. We are the ground level workers. Our family needs us. We are not like that. You just go on a ground and play your whatever the game and come back. No, safety of the my doctors is a prime importance. So while treating the patient, while saving the one life, I don't want to lose the single life of the my healthcare workers. So. This is a good idea. Having the N95 or mass surgical mask over the high flow, which may uh, safeguard certain uh, these things. So, whenever the, you are using this system, please train your uh, healthcare workers. Please educate them about the erosion generation. Please ask them to wear a full cover PP. Please ask them to keep the lowest flow as well as the mask in place and don't rush. I, I always say that you don't rush for the management. Take the proper precaution and then go for the management. But this is one of the one of the uh, advice therapy nowadays for the respiratory therapy in a mild uh, AIDS type of the patient. And look at the you can go ahead with the again the proning proning with the spontaneous proning with the high flow is uh, believe me the patients are so happy. If see like this lady, uh, she had almost uh, high flow. She on the fourth day she deteriorated. Her PO2 was something around about 50, saturation was 85. We put her on the high flow, then we requested her, and she she, she is a ma, she is a class four worker. She's that means she was not educated, but she cooperated very well because we explained them properly. See, look at the prone position, so comfortable she is lying. Lateral position, she is comfortable. Like she is sleeping. What else you need? The patient of the respiratory failure is sleeping quietly. Look at her face. The, her face is giving you the idea that ki, how comfortable she are. So that's what I always tell to the, my doctors or everyone. See the patient. Your patient face tells you whether your therapy is working or your therapy is not working. This type of the comfort sleeping in the afternoon time, like what we take the uh, snap, is what the success of this therapy. And if you explain them properly, first 15 to 20 minutes might be there is an uncomfortable prone position. But the ones they identify, they realize that this therapy is going to help them out. They themselves will go ahead with the uh, spontaneous cloning during night also. And that is the beauty of the uh, this uh, spontaneous cloning or self cloning. And it is possible on NIV also. Okay. Now third part. We are we are moving. We are isolating the respiratory failure. Now even high flow patient is not maintaining, or with the venturi mass patient is not maintaining. Patient is tachyptic, patient is tachycardic, but patient is conscious, patient is very cooperative, patient is communicating with you. These patients are likely to be a uh, candidate for your NIV. So, uh, if you go by the textbook indication for the NIV, if your patient is uh, having the pH in between 7.3 to 7.25, if your patient has a pH less than 7.25, it is he is not an ideal candidate for your uh, NIV. Then that means you have to go back. You just go ahead with the, your thinking process. Just try and find out you are not uh, stretching the limit of the NIV. Then patients should be conscious and cooperative. Sometimes what happens, patients are fully conscious, patients are communicating well, patients are uh, failure, but they are not uh, at all comfortable with the NIV. They are claustrophobic. I have seen the few patients, they are absolute claustrophobic with mask. This, uh, we don't want this particular mask. We don't want it. So then there is no choice. Either you have to again try the high flow or go ahead with the intubation ventilation. So cooperativeness is one of the backbone of the therapy of the NIV. If you want to be successful NIV, patient has to be the cooperative. Hemodynamically stable. If the patient is on one inotrope, two inotrope, BP is 80-90, he is not candidate for NIV. Please don't uh, stage the limit of the NIV. Excessive, uh, patient should not have the excessive situation. Now this is another concept. I have seen, the, forget about the corona, in regular practice, the pneumonia cases with the purulent secretions, corpus secretions you are putting in the BiPAP is not a good idea. BiPAP, though we are providing the humidification, that there is a positive dry air is there. So it may suppress your secretions because of the dryness. So if the patients have the excessive secretions, he might not be the good candidate for uh, NIV. 
comorbidities like uncontrolled diabetes, diabetic ketosis, BP is 200 by 100. Uh, I will I will try by PEP under the observation for first half an hour, and I will try to control those parameters, metabolic parameters. If it is a control, might be I will continue after half an hour. But it requires the very high skill backup, your regular blood gases, your monitoring and experience. I will not advise for each and every patient for uh, NIV. Sick but not morbid. And again, they are palliative type of the patient and able to protect airway. These are the certain basic requisites of the NIV. Look at this patient. He's, he's again, I always say that your patient is sleeping on NIV. That means you are, you are doing the right thing for that patient. That means your therapy is right. Your choice of the patient is right and therapy is working. Now, in Corona, particularly, you need to understand a few things. Generally, the concern, now the all advanced BiPAP machines are coming with the leak compensation. What do you mean by leak compensation? There is a particularly leak is allowed to avoid the tightness of the mask and the pressure pores. But in Corona, this is completely different. You need to select the mask properly. Your size of the mask has to be the perfect. Second thing, there should not be the leakage. Don't bother about the pressure pores too much. There should not be the too much leakage because then again it is an erosion generation. And generally prefer the uh, nasopharyngeal mask, naso oral mask. Don't prefer only nasal or uh, only facial. You prefer the nasopharyngeal full face mask. Full face mask is the right word. Proper seal should be there and there should not be the leakage. There should not be the any vein for preventing the aspiration and all these things. This is not the ideal one. Or, if possible, I don't know how many centers in India has uh, uh, this helmet type of the things, but that is one of the most advisable things from the Italy and the Spain experience. But this, this will be the much more ideal in a, a pandemic situation. But again, we are a resource limited country. Again, we have a lot of uh, issues. I will suggest the full face mask without seal is uh, uh, advisable. Next part. Try and uh, use the, uh, your invasive ventilator BiPAP. The beauty of the invasive ventilator BiPAP is they have the double dual uh, tubes. Generally, our uh, BiPAP has a single tube. If you see, uh, if I'm not wrong, see, this is a, this is a single tube. This is the uh, exclusive BiPAP. But then, uh, if possible, if possible, uh, try and use the double tube. What is, what is the advantage? At the expert limb, you can use the filters. Look at the, this viral filter. One should know the position of the viral filter, where to put the viral filter. If the viral filters are in place, viral load is, will be less, the healthcare workers will be safe. So one should know. So dual limb circuits are more preferable in a pandemic as compared to the single limb this thing. And the digital monitoring, yes, because monitoring is the backbone of the all circuit. Now, how to start the biopsy? Look at the setting. There's an IPAP, there is an EPAP, there is a respiratory rate. There is an oxygen, there is a time constant, and then these are the actual what patient needs. That decides whether your sitting is right. Like always, always start with the 10, uh, minimum 10 IPAP and the 5 EPAP. This is a minimum sitting. Please don't go below 8 of the IPAP and below 4 uh, centimeter of EPAP because then the whole concept of the non energy uh, ventilation will be gone. Minimum 4 IPAP and minimum uh, 8 IPAP has to be there. So generally, we start with the 10 IPAP and the EPAP. One should know the purpose of the IPAP. IPAP is always for the CO2 removal, and EPAP is nothing but the PEEP. That means the hypoxia. I'll come to that. Then you slowly uh, just go for the tidal mass 5 to 6 ml per kg by adjusting the IPAP. So IPAP minus EPAP is a pressure support. So whichever the uh, in on invasive ventilation, we keep the pressure support. In BiPAP, the IPAP minus EPAP is a pressure support. Suppose my IPAP is 10 and EPAP is 5. That means my pressure support to the patient is a 5. Simple to understand. So with this 9 and 5, I will be able to achieve the 480 tidal volume. It is absolutely okay for my patient. He was around about 70 kg. 480 it will be okay. Look at the respiratory 33. I am comfortable with the 33 heart rate. And saturation was 92. So my, my settings are working. That is how you correlate your IPAP and EPAP. Now the follow-up. How I will follow the so I will do the blood gas. If I do the blood gas, blood gas, after one hour, two hour, I find that the PO2s are still less than 50. That means I am problem with the hypoxia. Then I will increase the EPAP. Suppose after two hours, I see that my CO2 is rising. Then I will increase the IPAP and EPAP both. So 
if I want to wash out the CO2, I need to increase the IPAP and EPAP. If I want to correct the hypoxia, I will increase the EPAP. So slowly I will increase the EPAP by two if there is a hypercapnia. If there is a hypoxia, I uh, will uh, increase the EPAP because uh, it will uh, related with the hypoxia. But one should know the limit. I always say that everybody should know the limit of the machine. Know your machine. You should know the, everything about the machine. It's a respiratory physiology and the machine. Both should be done, known by the uh, operator. Your IPAP maximum has to 20 to 25. The moment you are going above that, that means either your selection of the patient is wrong or your patient is deteriorating or patient is having the additional problem or you haven't understood the respiratory figure. Probably he requires the intubation and ventilation. So if your IPAP setting in a, any given day or any given shift is more than 20 to 25, you have to go back to the square one, just think, uh, see the, uh, what is the indi indication was uh, for BiPAP. Just do the additional X-ray to rule out whether there is additional pneumonic patch or there is the ARDS. Go back to the vitals, go back to the other investigation and take a call whether I really need to continue the my BiPAP or I'll go for the intubation and ventilation. Maximum limit for the EPAP is 10 to 15. Again, if your EPAP is going about 10, it is an alarm. It is a clinical alarm. That means, again, you are not doing right with that therapy. You are stretching that therapy. It is very clearly evident now. NIV, if you stage the limit of the NIV, the mortality is directly proportional to the time. If suppose I started the NIV for the mild ARDS, first 24 hours or more than 12 hours, if the patient is not responding in terms of the hypoxia, tachycardia and the rest of the vitals, I need to go back and do the intubation and ventilation. So don't please see. One of the major issues with the corona patients is they are conscious and obeying. So what happens? We get diverted. We, we try to manage the patient emotionally. We said, hey, this is a young, this is a 50 year old, hey, this is a conscious, his BP is 140-90, his urine output is 2 liter, he don't have the fever. But these are all, all excuses you are avoiding for the intubation and ventilation. If your patient is not maintaining on NIV for 24 or 12 hours, please go ahead with the intubation and ventilation. Early intubation and ventilation in coronavirus may save that patient. Don't be rigid concept. In ICU, you, you cannot have the rigid concept. Yeah, I will not intubate or I will uh, intubate. There are the few ICUs they are very fond of the early intubation. Few ICUs are very fond of the late intubation. I am fond of the patient condition. If my patient demands intubation, I will go ahead within one hour. If my patient doesn't require for four days, I will not go ahead with the intubation. So this is how you should follow the, your NIV uh, in clinical setting. Now, the next very frequently asked question, where I should attach NIV? There are only very few conditions where you can use the nebulizer chambers in uh, corona setting. Like COPD, they require the bronchodilators or certain drugs you can use. But again, it has to be the distal to the viral filter. This viral filter is attached to the NIV. It has to be the distal to the viral filter and towards the mask. Because this viral filter is your protection. It is protection of the healthcare workers. If you do not use the viral filter, if you have a wrong side of the viral filter, if your viral filter is blocked, then you are at risk of the, uh, that particular virus. So one should know where you should go. So ideally, if some of your patients are in you put the viral filter, put the tubes, mask, and you can go ahead with the nebulization. What are the, what are the failures, NIV failures? Where NIV can fail your? Immediate failure, weak cough reflex, definitely. Copper secretions, yes. Patient is neurologically uh, semi-conscious, drowsy, becoming more drowsy, pakka, it is going to fail. Asynchrony, patient is claustrophobic, patient is not settling down, there is a tachycardia, worsening of the tachypnea. Please do not continue with the NIV, go back to the intubation and ventilation. Next 48 hours, your pH is persistently less than 7.25. That means underlying etiology is worsening. You have to avoid the intubation. Patient increased severity of disease. Might be on admission, there is a small patch after 24, 40 hours. There is a complete bilateral extensive shadow. There is no indication of NIV. Poor GCS on admission patient was conscious. After a few hours become drowsy. In the evening, he becomes almost comatose. No, it is not indication for the NIV. Might be during the, that drowsy stage, pick up and intubate and ventilate. And the late failures are generally the typical ICU reasons. Patient is having the peripheral neuropathy. Patient is having the functional problems, sleep disturbances, 
and patient is having the infection. Now, sleep response is very interesting. We, we take the history of the diabetes, we take the history of the hypertension, we take the history of the allergy, but we never take the history of the sleep. One should ask the patient ki, in which position he sleeps at home, semi-prone, prone or supine. I am quite sure the most of us sleep in a semi-prone or prone. Or this patient, semi-prone and prone, when they come to the ICU, you are putting on them NIV and asking them to lie in a supine position, he will not get settled down. This is a, this is a natural his uh, experience and the, his history. You should respect that. If the patient is having a habit of sleeping in a uh, semi-prone, put a biopam and ask him to uh, lie down in a supine position. You will get a more result. So I always say my all colleagues that the sleep history is the more important. Just ask them how many hours he sleeps, at what time he sleeps, in which position he sleeps, whether he has a sleep disturbance. That is going to decide the, your success of the, all these therapies. Sometimes what happens, right, your selection is right, your BiPAP setting is right, your patient is responding, and then after supine position, he is not able to sleep. Then he will start claustrophobia, he will start, uh, start having the sweating, you will have a tachycardia, and then you will say that the, your treatment is not uh, working. That is where you are going to fail your therapy. Okay, now we move to the next session. That is the intubation and ventilation. Clear indication. There is no way you can avoid the intubation in this condition. If there is a rapid progression over the hours, like on at 2 o'clock patient came in the afternoon, he had a nasal O2, at 3 o'clock he was on a BiPAP, and within half an hour, his saturation is 80%. Might be on admission, his saturation is less than 60%. No, he, these are not candidates for any other therapy, intubated and ventilated. Evolving hypercapnia. On admission, it was around about 55. After a few hours, it is 65. That means his work of breathing is worsening. He's having the hypercapnia. Hemotic instability. Your BP60 is too inotopic support. He is not a candidate for a high flow or BiPAP. He is a candidate for uh, intubation and ventilation. So this is, these are the indications where you cannot try any oxygen therapy. You have to go ahead with the regular intubation and ventilation. Now please mind it. When you are taking a decision of the intubation in corona patient, situation is completely different. See, there are four parameters which decide your difficulty in uh, uh, intubation. Patient, condition, staff and instrument. Patient. First thing, these patients are highly infectious. This is the one of the major drawback of this patient. Condition, unusual condition. This is you are in isolation ward. There are the facilities are less. There is a uh, there are no routine backup is there. There is a less staff and there are less instruments. So your regular intubation will become uh, difficult in Corona sick. These are uh, the factors: the highly infectivity, unusual condition, uh, less staff and less instruments. So what one need to do? Planning. Please don't rush for the intubation. If you rush for the intubation, you will land with the problem. So when you are outside, before entering into the ICU, you just decide who will intubate, whether he is an anesthetic, whether he is an experienced guy. Is it possible for him to in, uh, intubate in a one go? What is the plan B for the difficult uh, intubation? If suppose in spite of the, he is an anesthetic senior guy, and he knows the intubation, but intubation may get failed. So what is the plan B for that? Who will go inside? Only one or two persons should go inside along with that. What precautions, what facilities we need to have? The disposable laryngoscope? If yes, very good idea. Video laryngoscope? Yes, one should have the video laryngoscope. Different sizes of the tube, mask, viral filters, bag, into everything should be there. So look at the scenario. This is my uh, runner means the helper boy. I have planned everything inside. Then I will enter. The my operator who is the most experienced, preferably anesthetic, will go at the end. He will assess. He will check the drug and monitor by the assistant. Another assistant may help for the record and the other uh, equipment. There is a monitoring. This will keep a watch on the monitors. This operator will help them and the airway equipment and then go for the intubation. See, if you plan it, your intubation will happen within five minutes. If you go unplanned, it may happen within the next 50 minutes. And the moment it is 50 minutes, your exposure is increased, complications are increased, your workload will be there, and there will be frustration. So do intubation, but try and understand that situation where you are working. Now, next part, how to hold the mask. When you are intubating, this is a typical staring uh, will happen. That means you have to hold the mask with the two eyes. That means the tightness, water seal. 
immediately it has to be the seal, the mask, because patient is generating a lot of erosion. Then ambu bath. Look at the position of the filter. It has to be the before the mask. That means the distal end of the ambu bath and proximal end of this thing. So this this mask will go uh, over the face of the patient. Viral pro, uh, filter will protect your whole team. There is a peep. There will be the reservoir back. If suppose they, it is not uh, very compatible, attach a uh, any corrugated tube. It will give the flexibility. It will give you the space for the uh, ambu bag and mask. So this is where you should prepare first. Then go for the intubation and ventilation. Before intubation and ventilation, you can go for the pre-oxidation. You can pre-oxidate with the mask. Already I told you, mask with the bag. Already I explained you. So these these, these are the preparations for the. Before intubation, pre-oxygenation, you can go ahead with the ambu bag mask, you can go ahead with the mask, sealed mask, and you can go ahead with the uh, corrugated tube with the bag mask. Then, there are, there are so many things which are developed with the experience to avoid the viral load. We are resource limited country. I cannot get the more facility at every level. Simple thing, just have a transparent plastic bag over the patient. That may reduce the, your viral load. Look at that. There is a, a flexibility for the operator. Nothing is coming and there is a transparency. So this is where you can uh, uh, reduce your viral load or these boxes, these are nowadays famous across the India. These are the acrylic boxes where there are the two holes for the operator to enter. Now the problem is these are not the only compatible, uh, which are the most safest thing. There are some caveats are also there. There is a limitation for the movement. Because, see, the operator is not necessarily four foot, five foot or six foot. Sometimes they are six feet, sometimes they are four feet. So whether there is an adjustment of the hole, whether they are compatible with this, this thing, whether these hand movements, because your intubation is not necessarily the simple intubation. Sometimes it is a difficult intubation. So these are some caveats. But the advantage is that you are protecting the healthcare workers from the healthcare organization. So these are the two additional things. But I always I always prefer the this type of the simple easily available transparent drips which may help you for the free hand movement as well as the uh, reduction in the viral load and look at look at the filter position i will look at the filter position there is a mask there is a filter and then there is a tube this filter is the protection to you you should know where to attach the filter you should know where to put the viral uh, filters now next part okay now you intubated the patient now you are going for the ventilation all of us know that there is the ERDS. ERDS is not a radiological diagnosis. On, on the first slide, I switch, uh, uh, show you that there is a bilateral exchange shadows. Might be patient is on the venturi mask. It's comfortable. So ERDS is the syndrome. There has to be the clinical deterioration. There has to be the rapid clinical deterioration. Imaging shows the bilateral shadows asymmetrical. There has to be the respiratory failure, and then. If you measure the PO to FR2 ratio, that decides the mild moderate severe. So if my patient is having the fever, cough, breathlessness, my patient is saturation is less than 90, accessory muscle C is using, there is a tachycardia and tachypnea, X-ray shows the bilateral shadow, so it is likely to be ERDS. I will do the ABG. If the ABG is in between the PO2 and FR2 ratio is 300 to 200, it is mild. If it is 200 to 100, it is moderate. If it is less than 100, it is severe. So the moment ABG comes in my hand, I say that, okay, this is a severe ARDS, severe intubation, ventilation prone. It's a moderate ARDS. I may manage with the NIU, but intubation, ventilation likely to be. 200 to 300, okay, I have, I have a chance to avoid the intubation, ventilation. Might be I will try high flow and nasal, uh, sorry, NIV, and I'll try and control those particular uh, underlying precipitating factors. Now, one should understand the routine ARDS, which is the bacterial and the influenza ARDS. What is different between the, that ARDS and the corona ARDS? Injury site is respiratory system. The main thing is generally corona ARDS starts after the 8 to 12 days. So the, the moment you just take the history on the, the when you, patient presented to you, if it is on the day 9 and he has a uh, FR2, uh, PO2 FR2 ratio is 200, Less than 200 is likely to be going into the severe ARDS. Then lung compliance. Now, the major difference in between the corona uh, and other uh, non-corona ARDS is the compliance. Generally, all this influenza and the bacterial ARDS have the bad compliance. That means that there is rigid, lungs are rigid. They're not able to ventilate or they are, their compliance is very bad. 
in corona there is a different corona you get the more compliant lung that means lungs are easily inflammable uh, inflatable lungs are more uh, elastic and might be there you can do with the 8 to 10 p for lower p some ads may be uh, uh, typical ads but that is a major difference in between the corona and non corona ads lung compliance might be relatively normal in uh, corona ads then you can decide the severity and accordingly you can go ahead with the uh, your therapy now this is this is a typical this is the one slide uh, cover of the ads management if it is mild ads you can manage with either high flow or ni if you manage you are able to manage like most of the corona patients with the mild ads you can get away with the high flow or sometimes with the niv the moment your po2 fi2 ratio is uh, 200 to less than 200 you are heading to the moderate then you can have the high pp and all this thing and the uh, severe ads that means your po2 fi2 ratio less than 100 of course high pp neuromuscular proning recruitment inhale transplantary pressure ecmo and extracorporeal co2 removal these are the options again your patient decides might be on day 1 within 1 hour you can go for the ecmo might be after 8 days you can go for the ecmo might be within half an hour one hour on admission you can go prone or after two days also this decides the your patient decides the choice of the treatment so we'll go one by one so what is uh, ads management ads management is a lung protective ventilation what do you mean by lung protective ventilation lungs are already damaged we don't want to damage the further lungs like generally in ads there are three zones one is a normal zone one is a collapse and one is a completely affected lung so it is known as a baby lung because hardly one third lung is available for the your ventilation if you are not good with your ventilation strategy you may land with the problem like this one third gone lung don't bother about that lung this one third which is partially collapsed may be your target to open them and this remaining one third near normal lung your target is avoid the damage that means don't hyper inflate them and damage those alveoli and that is what the lung protective ventilation what what are the strategies in the lung protection ventilation low tidal volume neuromuscular blocking agents peep best peep recruitment proning and ecmo let's see now everybody knows there is a concept of the low tidal volume which is the ads net tidal in 2020 uh, 2000 it is clearly say, beneficial in terms of the low tidal volume 6 uh, cc per kg but 6 cc per kg per predicted body weight because no one does the actual body weight no one knows the uh, other way we we generally measure the predicted body weight predicted body weight is by the formula Uh, just measure the height of the patient, and there is a formula. No need to memorize. I, I I don't believe in the memorization. Just put it on your notice board. Just calculate the your daily uh, predicted body weight, and six cc per kg is your target. Now, when we say the in corona is a different from other ARDS, one should need one should need to understand what is different. In corona, there are two types of the phenotype: L type and H type. What do you mean by that? H type means the high, lung is highly elastic. That that means it is easily inflammable, uh, inflatable. They are highly recruitable. If you do the recruitment, patients can show the magical response to the recruitment. There is a high right to left shunt and a higher peep response. That means suppose how to know that this lung is phenotype H or phenotype L? Phenotype L is the lung is stiff. There is a low VQ match, low recruitability, and a limited peep response. so how to decide either you can go ahead with the hrc team just find out what type of the this lung or bed side just when you are putting them on intubation measure just measure the plateau pressure and the driving pressure what is the driving pressure your plateau pressure minus peep is your driving pressure if your driving pressure is more than 15 to 18 that means lungs are more stiff if your plateau pressure is more than 30 that means your lungs are more stiff that means it is l type this is that and accordingly you decide the your this thing if your lungs are h type you are uh, they are they are good they are well responsive to the your peep if you give them the peep if you do the recruitment manual the patient will respond better to the this type of the this thing. so how to decide the peep 
there are various methods of manage, uh, getting the accurate speed. Like you can go with the incremental, you can go ahead with the decremental, you can go ahead with the seeing the lower inflation power point by the PV curve on the screen. You can go by the transformer pressure, which is the one of the most accurate way. And you can go ahead with the uh, other methods. But try and understand for the uniformity in the management, we follow the AI designate. What is AI designate? There are two models, high PEEP and low PEEP model. What is in low PEEP? For the fixed FIO2, they have advised the fixed PEEP. Like if their FIO2 is uh, suppose 70% PEEP 10, if you are 80% PEEP 14, for 100% FIO2 keep 18 to 14. This is a low PEEP model. And what is the high PEEP model? For same 70%, they are saying the 20 PEEP, for 90, they are 24. So, Either I, I always advise this model for the uniformity. The, those who are uh, don't have the, that much skill, uh, personal uh, backup, don't know they have the facilities to manage the transponder uh, pressure or other things. They can go ahead with the this particular. And this is this is most of the time this is absolute sufficient enough to decide your peep. Generally, we we manage the peep in between 10 to 14. Very few patients request 20 to 24. But the moment you are going about assisting peep you need the better monitoring facilities in your ICU. Please don't try uh, higher PEEP. Other way around, the best thing is the uh, incremental, uh, decremental. Like you started with the 14 PEEP, be with the patient. See the heart rate, see the blood pressure, see the oxygen saturation, ABG. Okay, everything is mentioned, come to the 12. If the parameters are remaining still acceptable, come to the 10. This is a decremental way of coming of the PEEP. On the other way around, incremental means start with the 10, if your PO2s are still not improving, your vitals are stable, go for the 12. Still your vitals are stable, your platelet pressure is more than 30, your BP is not falling, go to the 14. So this is where you can titrate your uh, PEEP in uh, ARDS setting. But ARDS net is one of the most acceptable way of managing the uh, PEEP in this uh, particular setting of the ARDS. Now next. Suppose my patient is still not responding. He is sedated, he's paralyzed, he's on uh, volume control or pressure control, his PP is 10 to 14, his uh, other parameters are under control. Then next is the prone position. Prone, already I, we, I explained the, what is mean by self proning or what is mean by uh, conscious proning. Here it is sedated and paralyzed proning. Here the patient is completely sedated and paralyzed as per the indication on ventilator. So this is clearly shown an improvement, uh, a mortality benefit of 60 to 32 percent. Now, how to do the proning? What proning helps? If you observe the supine position, this is the basal part of the lungs, and it is almost collapsed or it is almost compressed, and the maximum perfusion is in this area. The moment you become uh, you uh, do the proning, look at the, this base part is quite getting clear. So this is perfused and ventilated. This is perfused and non-ventilated part of the lung. This is perfused and ventilated part of the lung. So naturally your vacuum is going to improve. And that is the beauty of the proning. And look at in a real time situation. If you see this is the supine lung. See, look at the, this is a more crowded ground grass appearance. There is a, some breakthrough. And the moment you do the prone, look at the same lung. Look at the same lung is opening. Look at the same lung is opening. It looks like a normal hyperinflated lung. So this is the beauty of the prone position. It ventilates the dorsal part of the lung, in a, which is the dependent and which is hypostatic, and you improve by proning. Now the next question is how long you can do proning? Up to 16 hours you can do the proning. Okay, so standard process. Uh, proning requires at least four ward by uh, four uh, healthcare workers. Proning requires before proning, you just secure your lines, catheter, tubes, tie the tube double, double dot, double tie, then check the leads, then do the proning. I will explain the proning. Then how long you can continue? Up to 16 hours. After 16 hours, you have to make the patient supine. When you do the supine, what is the purpose of supine? Clean him, nurse him, just check the position of the RT, just check the position of the tube, avoid the displacement of the tube. Do the uh, suction secretion, do the ultrasonor, do the x-ray. Just observe for two to four hours. If the patient maintains saturation, continue for four to six hours. If the patient doesn't make the, uh, maintain the saturation, again go for the proning. How many settings are advised? Maximum five. There is no established benefit of the proning after the five settings. That means 16 hours for five days. 
but in certain selective cases you can go up to the 8 to 10 so it is a your personal judgment and that patient response now uh, look at the, the, there are the, there are too many healthcare workers this is a western condition we cannot afford in india we can have the four see he is the one who is the main operator he is just uh, securing the line position everything he is holding the tube look at the his hand he is holding the tube then they are making him on the one side roll on look at then the other guys are helping him to the prone and finally he will be the prone but look at the, this guy this guy is a constant he is not moving around his whole concentration is the securing the tube in a prone position and securing line and catheter so he is a main operator these are the helping so this uh, get the patient to the corner of the bed then move him in that direction and make him prone now look at the position the, the, when you did the proning you have to manage the pressure force look at the head pillow yeah, nowadays there is a gel uh, these are the uh, made up of the gel they, they are preventing the uh, <coughs> your uh, pressure force look at the one pillow one pillow at the head with a lot of cotton and just don't forget to wrap to the eyes because one of the complication of proning is the blindness please please remember so don't go for more than 16 hours proning might be you can get the good saturation but at the cost of the vision so maximum 16 hours so there is the one pillow one pillow is below the chest one pillow is below waist one pillow below the leg look at the free movement for the abdomen and this is how you manage the pressure sore and the position and maintain that this is the actual uh, proning look at either you if you have the gel uh, foam type of the this uh, facility you can keep it like this if you do not have keep it at the side side of the face and frequently changing so it will help to avoid the pressure sore otherwise that patient if he recovers now he is going to tell everybody that i came from this particular hospital on the basis of the that pressure sore so avoid pressure sore avoid uh, this type of the injuries to the face and the recovery the most important thing prone therapy is not a risk it is a standard care you cannot say let the po2 go, go below 50 let the fo2 become 100% let the peep cross the more than 50 then i will try no prone is a standard care management in ards you can go ahead with the prone within one hour after the admission if you feel so now ad adjuvant therapies like you can do the recruitment and the high peep i told you there are the l type and h type when there is a high confluence type of the lung you can go ahead with the recruitment it will give you the good results high peep you can go ahead with the high peep in those particular patient all my vasodilators these are always in a uh, bucket list or they are always in a list of the uh, treatment part neuromuscular blocking agents there are the uh, pros and cons the up till 2013 nagm article say the uh, within 24 to 4, first 48 hours if you use the neuromuscular blocking agents there are moderate benefit but in 2019 there is the rose style came they said select your neuromuscular blocking agent as per the patient needs if the patient is deeply sedated and if patient doesn't require the neuromuscular blockage drug please don't give them within 24 hours also and the ecmo now the most important part and the most practical part i love to discuss this part every ventilator management okay what additional things when the patient is on a ventilator first thing always use the hme filter heated humidifier is not a good idea they are uh, the hme filters they are uh, in the both bacterial and viral filters they are uh, they are the very small and the compact piece in between the tubings they are not very costly around about 250 to 350 are charges and they are effective rather than heated and humidifier monitor the airway cup pressure please monitor the cup pressure in every shift it has to be the air pressure has to be in between 15 to 27 why it is like that because your capillary airway capillary pressure sorry, your arterial capillary pressure is in between 15 to 25 the moment your pressure is more than 25 you are going for the ischemia infarct necrosis and the your uh, edema of the cord and the stenosis of the trachea moment it is less than 15 you are going to get the leak so it is very important every shift one should measure the cup pressure then monitor record the tube depth see if you are going for the intubation and prone you should know at what uh, level you tied the tube whether it is what 22 24 the moment you make it supine and if your uh, tube is at 24 which was initially 22 that means definitely there is a displacement there will be the injury to the lung might be there is a collapse so immediately you have to withdraw and confirm with the x-ray so monitor and record of the case See, these are so simple bedside effective ways to avoid the complications it doesn't require any hi-fi facility then uh, uh, suction 
on the background of the corona please don't promote the open suction preferably on intubated ventilated patient has the closed suction cost is not very high negotiate with the company negotiate with your hospital try and make them available with the intubated patient at least one closed suction can go up to the 24 hours second part if unfortunately or because of the certain resource limited the your closed suction tubes are not available then while doing the open suction please take care of yourself having the uh, please have a glove full pp face shield do it quick and gentle don't go for the too uh, long term uh, long time uh, suction and avoid the exposure then avoid disconnection the moment you are going for the disconnection of the tube or filter you are having the viral load so make it sure that your all connections with the ventilators are properly fitted and tight every shift just take that so what to do suppose in spite of that there is a suddenly disconnection of the tube and filter what should do first thing clamp the tube the moment it is something like just keep the artifice on the bed side first thing you have to clamp the tube so viral load is not in the quick session you have to uh, retain but again please don't too much time with it it has to be the very major reflex type of the things you you need to clamp just connect it and open it so this is what the uh, very practical uh, way of uh, avoiding accidental extubation you cannot afford in uh, isolation ward because then the viral you are exposing the healthcare workers to the uh, particular viral load so avoid accidental extubation keep them properly sedated tie them if it is necessary keep the regular monitoring avoid unnecessary uh, drug holidays in needed patients and avoid the uh, accidental so that means the, your tube position you need to check regularly your ties you need to check every shift you have to make sure that the all connections are in right place tachycardia if needed after 2 weeks you can go ahead it is not the priority in uh, isolation icu next part is winning this is a, whatever the we discussed just now is a treatment the moment your patient is responding you will go for the weaning so as accessing the weaning that means the cuff electrolyte balance temperature vitals everything check whether patient is ready for the wean do the shallow breathing index that is another guide you can measure on the basis of the respiratory rate and the tidal volume and then go for the either spontaneous breathing tire or pressure support extubation and always keep a backup b plan for the reintubation so there is different ways of uh, weaning like you can go for the spontaneous breathing tire you can go ahead with the pressure support or sometimes extubate an uh, niv in a copd patient that is uh, also likely but again that is decided by the patient that is decided by the patient how many days on a ventilator what type of the lung disease he has whether there is a critical neuropathy whether there is a associated the organ failure is involvement is there that decides your winning uh, in patient and if you see the overall in one slide picture decides your winning failure that means if suppose patient is having cyanosis sweating patient is anxious patient is tachypneic muscles are uh, accessory muscles are used on a uh, your respondent respiration rapid breathing rapid pulse these are the signs will guide you that this patient is not ready for winning irrespective of your po2 and pco2 on blood gas and it is picked up your x-ray this patient is telling you i am not ready for weaning please don't extubate me then tackle extubation okay your patient is good your patient is responding your patient settled down you have gone through the all details you are extubating please before the extubation do the proper physiotherapy do the tackle and oral suction before the extubation prepare and check the all necessary equipment that means the moment you extubate there should not be the gush of the air either you put the n95 mask or venturi mask or the mask with the viral filter or the face so that is what the that is what the coordination and synchrony in between the extubation and the instrument has to be there after the extubation if patient doesn't need uh, require the oxygen put him on the face may require the oxygen face mask or you can uh, go ahead with the nasal cannula and this thing sometimes you can use the short general anesthesia to minimize the gush of the air but again uh, under the observation and with the experience operator this is this is a very nice figure i came across the one of the article uh, from the david regarding the extubation this is known as a tube mask extubation so this patient is ready for the wean so take the mask with the viral filter put the mask and a viral filter over the patient with the uh, oxygen and ambu bag here then 
for the better safety if the patient is having the load at least the another tube so you are increasing the distance from the tube and the uh, patient and then put the, your tube on the one corner of the mouth and the moment you estimate put the mask with the double filters and the tubes this is one of the classical idle tube mask uh, intubation uh, manual i don't know how many uh, of us are using but this is easily possible mask are easily possible filters are easily possible double tubes are easily possible and it requires one or two operator i don't think there is any uh, problem with doing the such type of the safe extubation in critical in patient i mean intensive is i cannot finish my lecture whether it is a ventilatory lecture or whether it is any type of the lecture without the fast hug we always say that the give fast hug to the, our every patient what is fast hug check the nutrition status feeding whether he requires rt feed whether he requires parental nutrition partial parental nutrition so feeding is the backbone of the all ventilatory management in all icu irrespective to whether it is a corona or non corona high protein uh, management so every day dietitian should come and say that your protein need is 1.5 g to 2 g maximum your carbohydrate whether uh, you will use the artificial feeds or kitchen feeds or the combo you can have the partial parental nutrition daily calorie deficit for the ventilator patient believe me the patients who are over ventilator have the tremendous need of the calories and if you do not bother about those calories what will happen at the time of the weaning you will face the difficulty because you are paying for that those two weeks at the time of the weaning your weaning will be another two weeks and as i said your patient should be comfortable on ventilator patient should be sitting patient should be mobilized and it will be only possible with the proper analgesia i say always the analgesia and sedation is a art in critical care how how accurate you are with the sedation and the analgesia your patient comfort will be there so i always look at the patient face if the patient face is happy smiling communicable that means you did the right thing sedation now one should know what type of the sedation like if suppose i want to try winning in the early morning at 8 o'clock my sedation plan should be 8 pm one day prior i cannot decide the winning in the early morning so i advise them to switch over to the uh, less sedative switch over to the uh, drugs which will which will give me the awake patient in the morning for the winning thermo prophylaxis duty prophylaxis now everybody knows corona is a coagulopathy microvascular coagulopathy so every icu patient should have a, on low molecular heparin 0.4 sub q bd in certain high risk patients like obese or those who are with the extensive pneumonia or copd i would prefer to give the 0.4 sub q bd also head up position head up position don't believe on anyone just go and physically measure what is head up position Uh, we have the automated bed, so we can easily get the values. But uh, this has to be the minimum 30 to 45 beds and maximum up to the 90. That that gives a lot of uh, benefit. Ulcer prophylaxis, yes, uh, one of the uh, bundle. It is a half bundle. That means you can have the daily availability, daily sedation, holiday, duty prophylaxis, ulcer prophylaxis, and head up. This is the half bundle and glycemic control. please bother about your sugars please bother so then in addition with that you can manage your antibiotic part you manage with the fluid part you can manage with the cardiovascular part you can manage with the metabolic part so before winning give a good fast up to the your patient along with the stability then the last part last part is the cardiac arrest that is another frequently asked question if somebody uh, face the cardiac arrest situation don't rush for the resuscitation without your full protection at least there has to be the n95 or ffp3 mask eye protection plastic aprons minimum and the gloves whether you are in ward whether you are in non covid situation whether you are covid situation whether you are in covid icu or whether you are in emergency the protection of the healthcare worker is a prime important while going to bed second thing don't be uh, so uh, passionate about the cardiac patient don't go for listening the sound or just uh, touching the feeling the breathing these are all not advisable in corona patient and if your operator is an anesthetist or a train then only immediately go for the intubation because it will uh, help to reduce the viral load while doing the cpr but if your operator is not trained anesthetist or you are not sure in the first go you will go for the intubation please continue the bag mask ventilation along with the filter i already explained how to use the filter with the bag mask and 
void with the cardiac muscle. So these are the certain particular precautions one need to take in a cardiac arrest situation. So, ladies and gentlemen, friends, to summarize the uh, respiratory support in COVID, profound hypoxemic respiratory failure from the acute respiratory distress syndrome is a dominating finding in critical ill patients. That means 5 to 10 percent. For most of the critical ill patients in COVID, prefer the lowest possible fraction. Like if the patient needs two liters, patient needs two liters. Don't go for the ventilator mask. Necessary to meet the goals, like your saturation is targeted in between 90 to 96, and your PO2 is uh, 55 to 60 maximum. The decision to initiate the non-invasive modalities like high flow and NIV requires the balancing risk and benefit. The, your patient condition, patient cooperation, associated comorbid conditions, secretions and the type of the ERDS, whether it is a mild, moderate, severe. And please, please be uh, concerned with the risk of the exposure to the healthcare workers before using these technologies. Nowadays, the most of the evidence is in flavor of the high flow nasal oxygen rather than NIV. But again, it depends on your patient and it changes from patient to patient. Intubation in COVID is a, one of the most high risk procedures. Attention should be paid for the doning full personal protective equipment with airborne precaution. For air dash ventilation, low tidal volume is the advisable. But you, if your patient is a complaint type of the lung, then you can go up to the 8 ml per kg. Target plateau pressure is less than 30. And titrate your PEEP as per the, your plateau pressure. Whether patient requires high PEEP or low PEEP and as the type of the patient. If patient fails to improve within few hours or a uh, few minutes to the low tidal volume, go for the prone ventilation. Prone ventilation is the standard care for the or standard advisable treatment for the ARDS. It is not the risky or desperate therapy. Don't wait till patient deteriorate further. For COVID patients who develop the ARDS, prognosis is poor with the mortality range from 50 to 67%. This is my team. I always wonder this team, they don't have the caste, they don't have the race, they don't have the names, they don't have the gender, they don't have the identity. Only they have a team. Their identity is their team. And this team is going to decide the prognosis and your uh, results of your ICU. So I always say that Corona taught us a lot many things. To get away from the all other things, your team is going to make the wonder in your ICU than in your hospital. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kapil. It was a wonderful practical tips oriented in the deliberation. And I think most of the concept regarding ventilation must have been clear for all. Uh, now, um, the, Madam, I think we can invite questions. And um, the, we are here to answer whatever the queries put by the, um, the, the, the persons who are listening to this particular presentation. So should we start question and session? Yes, sir. Any questions, any doubts regarding ventilatory management? Sir, there are a few uh, questions in the chat box. Can I answer them one by one? Dr. Jirpe, that will be a good idea. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, the, uh, one of the questions is, um, again, for the treatment, it is not related to the ventilator regarding the status of remdesivir and flaviparin. Uh, please excuse me from answering this question because this is not the topic of today. Uh, Kadam sir can answer that. Then the, one of the question, another question is, the, how long we can continue neuromuscular blocking agents and which drug is better? I already explained till to, uh, when there was the first trial came in 2013 NHM, uh, the mortality benefit were shown in first 48 hours when we use the paralyzing agent. But 2019 rose uh, trial changed the concept. Now they are saying that it is not must to use the neuromuscular blocking agents for 48 hours in a continuous deep or regularly. You can uh, initially you start with the uh, neuromuscular drugs and the gestation deep. Keep the patient under the deep sedation and if required, give them. So you have to select you about the patient to patient. It is not a blanket cover for first 48 hours. There has to be the neuromuscular blocking agents. Then uh, next question is, can we prone in obese patient? Yes, why not? 
I have just now uh, 150 kg patient. We have thrown him. There are a lot of uh, issues will come like you need the good healthy ward boys and the healthcare workers. Then your bed capacity is more important. Sometimes bed gets crashed because of the weight of the patient. Third thing, when you are making the prone of the obese patient, you have to understand that these all critical ill patients have a lot of skin issues. Their skin gets easily peeled. So you have to have a lot of cotton and the uh, protective uh, butter like gel foams and this thing behind the chest as well as the face. And most important part is when you are proning the obese patient, there is always risk if the patient grows into bradycardia or hypotension or arrest. It is not easy to make him super. That has to be so. Your, your ICU backup has to be the very ideal for uh, doing the uh, obese patient in prone. But obesity is not a contraindication for prone. You can please go ahead with the prone. Then uh, next question is uh, how, how can how can prone causes the blindness? The theory is that when you do the prone position, retinal hemorrhage is one of the things which is observed and that may cause the blindness in a prone position. Then next question is what infrastructure is needed to set up high flow oxygen? No infrastructure. You need that machine. You need that training. You need the central oxygen. That's all. This, this, is, a, this is actually possible in any issue whether it is government, private or uh, uh, even uh, 50 better hospital also. <laughs> then next question is who should be which mode should be preferred on the invasive ventilation let me clear this concept it is not must pressure control is good for the invasive ventilation it depends on again your type of the ICU your nursing uh, backup your intensive backup no what is that? Suppose there are two types of the mode, volume control and pressure control. Volume control, the simple to understand, there is a guarantee of the volume. But the, the, as per the pressure, there may be change happen. In pressure control, there is no guarantee of the tidal volume. As per the patient, change in compliance, the tidal volume will go up. So volume control is very safe and the preferred mode in most of the issues because they require less selection, less paralyzing agent, less monitoring. Assured tidal volume will deliver to the patient. What about the pressure control? It is more advisable in the ERDS, but it requires a lot of sedation, paralyzing agents, good monitoring, adjustment of the pressure to deliver the particular amount of the tidal volume, trained staff. So there are pros and cons of the both, uh, both modes. What we advise generally, if your ICU, if your infrastructure, if your team is compatible with the volume control, please go ahead with the volume control for the EIDS also. It is not much like the pressure control is the only choice of the mode for uh, uh, EIDS. So these are the few of the questions uh, in, the, in chat box. Any additional questions? Anyone has any question? Karam sir? Any questions regarding uh, ventilation, ventilatory management? Are there any queries? I have a question, sir. Please. Yeah. Axis Bank, I have, I have a question. Can I ask? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah if prone position is giving Hello. prone position is not possible, hmm. then is the lateral position ventilation advisable and is how useful it is? See, you need to understand the concept of the prone position. Yeah, I got it the concept. A, yeah. so, so no point in giving lateral position, right? No, no. See, what I am saying. The yes, prone so. position is for improvement yes, in the uh, peer pressure. If prone position is not possible, nine, nine. lateral position you can go ahead. But uh, uh, yeah, benefits are not Okay. 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 And one more question for HFNC. Is it necessary to have a negative uh, uh, suctioning you, you mean to, to avoid negative, aerosol? You mean to say negative pressure rooms, right? Not negative pressure rooms. For HFNC, yeah. uh, one of the webinar had advised to have a negative okay. suctioning at the other end. I didn't understand that to avoid aerosol. Okay. See, the, How the, to probably, do that? Probably there was a misconception. 
high flow is a high aerosol generation procedure. So, so in, in, a, in a preferable in a negative pressure room, because negative pressure room, not the negative pressure structure. But if it is not possible, then Either so keep it in the non AC room, possibly, or right. have some ventilation uh, for know. that room or exhaust fan or something like that. Yeah. I told you, na, uh, <laughs> keep the pressure in between 20 to 30 ml maximum. So, the N95 mask or the N95 mask. I'm not able to uh, hear you. There is a lot, lot of disturbance. There is a lot of disturbance. Okay. Oh, sir. Eight minutes. Mute as a server. Answer Katana mute Karunta. Okay, uh, I'll again repeat. Yeah, that. Do my... Yes, any other questions? No, I will answer sir. that previous question, sir. No, just... Probably, madam, we uh, are it properly. For the high flow nasal oxygen, negative pressure room is preferable, but unfortunately, there is no luxury of such rooms in India. So, uh, you can have it in a non AC private room or single room. Second thing, the, uh, train your healthcare workers to take a precautions when they are entering in a high flow nasal oxygen room. Okay. Use a full PP, N95 mask, don't go too much close. If preferably have a surgical mask or N95 mask over that uh, high flow to the patient to avoid the further uh, viral load. So, such uh, practical tips we can do it and keep the flow of the high flow maximum up to 30, 30 or 40 if required. Don't go for the 60 liters, then might be uh, you are generating more air. Okay. Sir, one question. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, sir, one question. Yeah. Uh, sir, the viral filter you are talking about, uh, should we attach the viral filters to both the inspiratory and expiratory limb and are the viral filters are different than the bacterial filters or they are same HIV filters? Um, viral filters are different from the bacterial filters. Okay. So you have to check with the store which filters you are getting. Some okay. filters are bacterial as well as viral. Okay. okay. Second thing, it should be at the always at the expiry end of the this thing. Or expiry uh, end. Expiry, expiry, uh, or you can have two filters. You can have the expert filter and you can have at the Y shape. So it's a double protection. See, uh, only thing is that if you use the too many filters, you have to bother about the dead space and the blocking of those filters. So uh, the moment your peak pressures are going very high, first take the uh, potency of those filters. That is more important. Corona. So, in any ARDS, we we have to think like it's a COVID and non-COVID and then attach the filters of viral filters or bacterial filters in every ARDS. Nowadays, every ARDS, uh, treat them as a COVID ARDS. Okay, okay. Fine. Don't bother about whether it will turn out to be positive or negative. Treat them as a COVID ARDS. What is harm in putting the filters? The that is the safety of the all uh, health care. Yes. Hello, yes, any other questions? Comments? Two minutes. If hospital has to acquire a ventilator or a HFNA device, which one will you advise first? Sir, it depends on your workload and the, your uh, no, initial, patient initial load. Setup, initial setup going from asymptomatic to mild symptomatic, now going up See, to sir, go sir. for a little higher facility. Sir, simple. If you are getting the more and more milder patients, high flow will be, I will prefer to have more and more high flow. So it depends on the what type of the patient load. If I am getting the too many uh, ARDS patients, I'll go for the regular ventilator. No, obviously, it, Ruby Hall will always have more ventilators <laughs> and equal number of high flows. But in a small, say, sub-district hospital, if we have to increase our work. High flow, I will advise the high flow, sir. Sir, one question regarding BiPAP and CPAP. Uh, some of the task force uh, guidelines mention that ki BiPAP is more aerosol generating and uh, CPAP is more useful. So you have told the concept very nicely that you have to put that IPAP and EPAP, uh, uh, the settings and all. So uh, uh, aerosol generations are less with this, uh, like See, what is the probability? When we started the Corona in March and April, na, there was a lot of myth about the aerosol generation like high okay. flow and the NIV are more aerosol generation. But now that dust is already uh, settled. Now with the NIV also, there is not that much aerosol generation is happening. You have to you have to see the how you are using, like the, the speed of the mask, type of the mask, the size of the mask, and the filters. Then there will not be aerosol generation. Okay.
any other questions any queries sir h type and l type uh, you told driving pressures and you have to calculate that sir can you a little uh, like uh, elaborate like uh, how on a ventilator uh, p pressure and p plateau pressure we can calculate Simple. So, what what is driving pressure? Plateau pressure minus P is the driving pressure. See, some ventilators can give you the driving pressure. So, just see your plateau pressure okay. and your set P. Your plateau pressure minus set P is your driving pressure. Okay. Okay. All the questions queries are over regarding ventilation. Prashant, hello. Yes, sir. No, there is some problem with internet in the uh, at my end. Okay. So, uh, can Prashant type the question again? Sir, sir, in chat, there is a question. Ah, hmm. Bhakta, I am very busy. Bhakta. And that question of nebulization in patient on ventilator, I think he has already shown the way to be done it. So I think we had the nice presentation by Dr. Kapil and it was practical oriented. We, it has cleared many of our doubts. Regarding other questions, we can talk on the, the next VC when we are dealing with drugs separately for each and every drug and how to use it. I think let us uh, give a big hand to Kapil and say thanks to him. Thank you, Kapil. Yeah. And thank, thank you, Prashant. Thank you, sir. Thank uh, you. Uh, Prashant, can we uh, get over with this? Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, all participants. Thank uh, you. If just we will tell you, madam. One I suggestion, sir. If, uh, hello. Hi, yes, madam. Uh, sir, uh, will you like to take the sessions again after 10 days or 15 days? Because I think many of the medical college, even GMC Jalga was not aware of this. I got this from some other uh, group and uh, many people want to attend. And uh, can you repeat the session again? Kadam, sir. So, uh, so basically, because uh, it was uh, 11th uh, hour. You want the same session all over again? Sir, again, after 10 days, because these things are needed, I guess. And uh, uh, after 10 days, the same session. Because when I have seen the box, even Jalgao people, only two people have attended this. And everywhere mm -hmm. there are at least... Nee, uh, there was a, there, nee, nee, nee. We have, that's why we have given a prior intimation that all those who are managing Corona ventilation should attend so that this can be disseminated well and we can be able to serve the ventilated patients. So if, they, they, if we just check how much is the demand and can uh, have it uh, after 15 days and yes. uh, I think um, they, uh, they, we can have it as a question answer session and uh, by, after uh, giving uh, some basic sir, concept please repeat, sir. Sir, please repeat this Hello? Sir, please repeat, sir. Sir, we missed the session. Uh, okay. repeat the same okay. session, sir. Many, we have given a fantastic lecture. Again, uh, yes, sir. Because we are working in COVID and uh, we want again uh, to listen. This program is completely recorded, so it can be repeated. He can, I know he is very busy, so he can join us for about 15-20 minutes to yes. answer yes, all definitely. questions. Definitely, sir. Same, same, same thing. Okay. Thank ah, you. So it is recorded already. Ah. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. So thank you, thank you, Kapil. It was excellent. Uh, Purusha uh, topic, uh, kya hai sir? Madam, madam, say ki Purusha topic badal kya? Hello. Which one is? Hello. Open karo decide. Thank you. Salut. Kapil, uh, Kapil, do you suggest a topic? You have sir, covered cytokine storm, topic. clinical yeah. features, diagnosis. Sir, actually, na uh, drug therapy there is na, there are so many. Yeah, we will have full thing on drug therapy. Drug therapy so, will be the more practical one. Yeah, and basically, we had discussion on drug therapy in task force, so we can get uh, in the bar, bar, Bharat also also to join, yeah. and uh, others also to join, and we can have a detailed discussion and detailed um, the uh, advice regarding drugs to be used in uh, COVID disease. COVID. Will that yes, be okay? Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 
Yeah. Then we can take that. No problem. Hmm? Thank you. Right. Thank you all. Then we will okay. just silence. Bye to everybody. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.